and welcome once again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk. Ta -da. Here, once again, we're back in Altamont Springs, back at the Days Inn Motel, Motel, whatever it is, in Altamont Springs. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, it's been a, a while since we've been here, since we left here last time, that the three of us were here to do a Bible study. Alice and I have been over to Daytona Beach, down to Kissimmee, back in the I Drive, and then up here. So. You've been all over the place. <laughs> yeah, and we're about to really start, so. But it's good to be back, good to be yeah. together, good for, we enjoy being together, we enjoy being together with you. Yes, we do. And we're glad that you can join us in these studies. And I want to uh, remind you that we encourage you to write to us, let us know where you're watching from, any comments or questions that you have, mm -hmm. suggestions, write to us at office at BibleTalk.com. Okay? Yes, we're continuing on, this should be our, our fifth study. Yes in our series, The Evidence of a Redeemed Life. And remember, the purpose of this is to examine ourselves, to examine ourselves, mm -hmm. not for me to examine you or for you to examine me, to see if Christ is visible in us. Yes, He's given us new life, and as I said, that should bring new lifestyle. And that lifestyle should be visible. It should be visible to the Lord. It should be visible to us, and it should be visible to those around us. Yes. And what we're doing is looking at, okay, what are the attributes, what are the characters, what characteristics, what, what is the evidence of Christ's redemptive work in our lives? So this is our, what did I just say, fifth, fifth. fifth chapter. Fifth part. And, fifth part. And it basically boils down to the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Jesus did say, after all in the Sermon on the Mount, that you shall know them by their fruit, right? Absolutely. Uh, so we're going to continue on in that. But before we do, I'm going to ask Brother Mark to ask the Lord's blessing on our time together today. Oh Lord, thank you for letting us get together today. Yes. Just open up our hearts so we can learn your word. Amen. 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 All right, uh, we're going to talk today about two things, patience and kindness, Lord willing. Um, these are, as I said, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Okay? When you talk about patience, well, let me, let me just talk about this first before we get into this. Today, and I'm going to, uh, today is, we're in January 2014, 50 million Americans will walk into one of the 160,000 fast food restaurants mm -hmm. that dot the national landscape and spend their share of the $110 billion that stuff the cash registers of those iconic stores every year. Yeah. I'm trying to remember all those... Anyway, well, but the thing is, because people want it fast. You know, Alice and I and Mark uh, lived in Central America. And we lived out in the bush. And getting a meal down there was certainly no fast process. Mm. You know, I think we've shared this in other, other studies, mm. that we lived just on the outskirts of a little village out on the bush. And we lived next to the village chief, Frank, remember Frank? Mm -hmm. And he and his wife Myrtle had ten children. And in the morning, when Mama was going to make breakfast, she would send a couple of the kids into the, into the forest, into the jungle, to cut wood for the fire. She'd send a couple of the girls down to the river about a quarter of a mile away, especially during the dry season, to haul water back. I mean, just preparing a simple breakfast was an incredible, incredible task. A time-consuming and labor-intensive task. Whereas, you know, we drive up, we don't even go into the store, you just drive up to the window and expect in 10 seconds to have, have the meal. That's the way we have been conditioned in the West, this fast food mentality that affects an awful lot of our lives. Uh, if any of those people that are going to the fast food stores right now in Orlando, Florida, because we're in Altamont Springs on the outskirts of Orlando, Florida, that's where we are. If they're going on uh, I-4, the interstate that runs through Orlando, to get to the fast food place, they will most likely be speeding on Interstate 4 right? to get there. Yes. Uh, 
it's, it's amazing, and I'm sure no matter where you are in the United States of America, you probably have some experience with this, that I drive, confess your sins one to another. I'll go up to Orlando, and I typically drive at 10 miles an hour over the speed limit. Now, if you think that that has to do with being not submissive to governing authorities, it has to do with the issue of safety in life. Because when I'm doing 10 miles an hour over the speed limit, cars are whizzing around me consistently, going 10, 15, and 20 miles an hour faster than me. So I'm driving that speed just for, purely for safety so it, it doesn't get nutsy. Everybody is in a hurry. That's what it seems like. Everybody is impatient. And we're going to look at patience, all right? Now, that's the world. Unfortunately, some preachers, a lot of preachers as a matter of fact, would have you believe that faith gives you the right to be impatient. I've heard, you you're looking at me strange? No, no. I, I've heard so many preachers quote Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the assurance, and they turn around and say, they proclaim faith is now faith. So you have to get it, whatever it is, mm -hmm. now. Right? Have you never heard this? Oh, what yes. can you do for me now? Now. It's like, okay, we make, we make the same, <laughs> uh, this sounds ridiculous, we make the same demands on God that we make on McDonald's. That's right. Get it to me and get it to me now. I want patience, and I want it right now. Hallelujah. Yeah. So both the world and much of the church, that's with a small c, are cultivating, they're nurturing, nurturing and growing impatience in people. Yes. Yeah? However, that is obviously not the Lord's teaching nor his purpose. Think about this. Think about Abraham, who, who Paul in Romans talks about being the father of our, of our faith, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. and, and Abraham is where it starts. Yes. You know, the God, we serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Here's what it says. For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply you. And so, having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. That's Hebrews 6, 13 through 15. Patiently waiting. I mean, here is the example of faith. When God called him to go, he just got up and went. But it says he obtained the promise by patiently waiting. And just a couple of verses before that in Hebrews chapter 6, it says this. I'm going to read from uh, verses 11 and 12. Mm -hmm. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you will not be sluggish, but be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Mm -hmm. So faith is coupled with patience. Yes. You know, God is not a, a genie. That if you say the prayers, just the right, say or just write the word words, confess the, the right words, he has to pop out of a bottle like a, a genie and you, you know start granting you your wishes. Faith is hearing what God wants and you obeying it, not going to God so He can hear what you want and Him obeying it. Right. Don't get this upside down, right? God's word and His Spirit bear the fruit of patience in our lives. This is the fruit of the Holy Spirit we've been talking about, right? Because he has revealed that there is indeed an appointed time for everything, and there is a time for every event under heaven. That's what it says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Yes. There's an appointed time for everything, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily, I was going to say not necessarily, it's not our time schedule. No. It's his schedule. And if you, if you understand that, that we're doing everything on God's time schedule, please remember what the word says, that to him... A day is a thousand years, a thousand yes. years is a day. That's right. Okay? No one can ward off his hand to say to him, what have you done? You see, one of the things that gives you the ability to have that fruit of patience in your lives is because we understand that he's in control. That's the bottom line. Right, okay? So remember what King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon said when he had been humbled by God, and we need to be humbled before God. He said, all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does, a, God, he does according to his will 
in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth. And no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? It's in Daniel 4.35. God does what He pleases. He's God. You know, and I know I've shared this in other studies. I was teaching in London one time. And uh, the leader of this group that I had been teaching to, uh, from, from, who were mostly from Cameroon, uh, West Africa, came up to me and said, you know, in all the years that you've been traveling and preaching, what's the most important, the single most important thing that you've learned? And I said, well, I thought about that. That's a really, that's good a really question. good question. Yeah. And I thought about that and I said, well, okay, the most important thing that I've learned is Jesus is Lord and I'm not. He's in charge. If He is the Lord of your life, He's in charge. Right. It's up to Him to determine. And God has. He de he's determined your times and the boundaries of your habitation. That's what it says, what Paul said to the Greeks in Athens. God is in char charge. God is in control. You know, Jesus, I think, made that very clear when, when He said, when He said, My Father, who has given them, that's a redeemed, to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand that's John 10 29 a lot of times we think oh this is out of control you know it's like we talked about when we talked about I think last week we were talking about the Apostles uh, having peace right when they were in the in the boat going across the Sea of Galilee and they were so concerned when a storm rose up that they went to Jesus and said don't you care we're perishing yes he cares you know, he said, cast your cares upon me because I care for you. He cares and he is in control. He stood up and he said to the sea, peace, be still. He is in control of everything going on in our lives. Sometimes it may seem like other people and other situations are in control of our lives. Mm -hmm. And it will, it will seem like that to you until you come to that place where you have the peace of understanding that if it's going on in your life, he knows it. He cares about it. And if he's letting it go, he's got a reason, right? Now, it's, it's good for us to remember. I want to take a second just to remember at this point. This is not a study of patience, right? This is about understanding how the Lord looks at us, right. how we're to examine ourselves, and how the world sees us or doesn't see Christ's redemptive work in us. Yes. Right. That's what this is about, okay? This is about, am I living this? Is this visible in my life? Okay? Think of what Paul said in Colossians. So that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please Him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to His glorious might for the attaining of all steadfast, steadfastness and patience joyously. That's Colossians 1, 10 and 11. All right? So you're walking, this is about are we walking in a manner that's worthy of the Lord? Are we walking in a manner that is the manifestation of Christ in our lives? Mm -hmm. We are, after all, the temple of the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. All right? That's not a temple easily shaken. It shouldn't be shaken at all, right? Mm -hmm. Sorry, it's on the rock. But, okay, so when we talk about impatience, though, impatience is cultivated by that evil that Paul places as the gateway sin to his list of sin in the second letter to Timothy. In the last days, 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul says, in the last days, perilous times will come. And he says, here's why it's going to be perilous. The first one, men will be lovers of self. And that is the gateway, the floodgate to all of the things that follow. Right? That's 2 Timothy chapter 3. What's another way to describe that? Pride. Well, it is pride. Absolutely. That's, that's the and gateway to all sin. It is the yeah, gateway to all sin. Is a, yeah. That is. Remember, Paul is, a, Paul is a true, true Bible scholar. Yes. I mean, he knows. So he, don't think that he said these things without being influenced by what God had spoken through Solomon in Proverbs. Mm -hmm. Proverbs chapter 6 says, Six things does the Lord hate, yea, even seven are an abomination to him. And the very first one is haughty eyes. Haughty eyes is pride. Love of self. It's the same thing. Pride is the gateway that opens the door to all sin. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So the love that he speaks of, the self-love, the love of self that he talks about there, is destructive because it's all-consuming. It leaves no room for true love. Self-love leaves no room to consider others. Okay? Other people and situations only become aids or obstacles to what we're doing. Mm -hmm. They're all pawns in the kingdom of self. Mm -hmm. They only matter in your life as to how they either help you along to accomplish what you want or, pro or, or hinder, yeah. right, or hinder. Mm -hmm. Benefit you, help you, or hinder you. That's right. And that's the way you look at people when you are filled with pride and are being a lover of self. That's hardly the self-denial that Jesus demanded of his disciples, you and me, right? And certainly not the type of life that would show forth evidence of the Lord's work in us. Now, you, you probably know that the, in the fruit of the Holy Spirit, when it says patience, right? The fruit of the Holy Spirit is patience. The King James trans that, translates that as long-suffering. Okay. And, and that's certainly because, and that's, that's valid in the sense that you're only, you only exercise patience when you're enduring something. When you're enduring, when something in your life is unpleasant, right? right? right. You don't have to endure or be patient with, with the things you enjoy. You know, people are going to go sit in a cold, bitter, bitter cold, and watch a football game and sit there and suffer. And they're not for being patient. Hour after hour. They're not, they're not exhibiting patience. No. They've chosen to be there because they, they want to be this. They, this is what they enjoy. Because they're stupid. Let those same people go and get in a line at the grocery store to check out behind and have to wait three minutes. Mm. And all of a sudden, their patience is put to the test. Yes. Patience comes. It is long-suffering. It is the ability to endure what you don't like, what you don't enjoy. Right. Okay? You know, I've, I've had that happen so many times when... And you said when you're in a grocery store, or, or if you're online anywhere, and you're not even aware, I mean, it, you know, it is what it is, so you just stand there. And when you get up to the person and they say, thank you for your patience, and you don't even, yeah. you're not even thinking about that you were being patient. You were just doing what you, know, you had to do. What else could you do? But stand no, you know, but I, 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 I have come to the place where I really love it when that happens. Yeah. And, that, and, you know... It's an opportunity. No, but it happens a lot. Yeah. You know, Alice brings out a good point, because that happens a lot. We'll go someplace, and we'll have to wait. We're being, you know, we're being waited on, whether it's a restaurant or a store or something, mm -hmm. and people will say, I, I thank you for your patience. Mm -hmm. That's because they expect impatience. All right. All right? They know that most people become impatient. And when we say this, it's a great opportunity, and Alice will attest to the fact, yes. every time somebody says that to me, I'll say to them, it's that's because fruit. patience is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Right. Exactly. It's an opportunity to share God's Word. It's an opportunity to tell them about the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That's right. Look for, you know, God gives you opportunity. Always. He does. He He's does. He's always there. I do seminars on biblical principles for personal and professional growth. And one of the things I talk about, you know, you have to... Have, you have to have the vision to see the opportunities that God places before you because He's always placing opportunity before you. But you also have to have the courage to seize the opportunity. you got to see the opportunity, but then you have to seize the opportunities. And life is filled with opportunities for you to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to other people. Impatience is about other people or situations interrupting or delaying our plans and purposes. Does that sound fair? You're fleshly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Im yes. Because impatience, if patience is the fruit of the Holy Spirit, then impatience has got to be a deed of the flesh. That's your flesh at work. Mm -hmm. But that comes about when you feel like your, your purposes, your purposes are being interrupted or delayed. It may be, like I said, it may be online at a bank or a checkout at the grocery store. Or driving to the place where you where you want to get to to do what you want to do, you know, and you're in traffic and you become all. Do you not see? I talked about the traffic here in Orlando. All you see, the time. Well, I'll tell you what. You see the impatience at play all the time. People zigging in and out of yeah. out of traffic, 20 miles, 25 miles an hour over the speed limit, endangering not only their own lives but endangering yes. other lives, yes. and that's a fact. Patience is, as Alice said, it's about enduring. It's about 
it's about enduring, putting up with, or, you know, that's a bad way to put it, but yeah. putting, not putting up with, but putting others before ourselves. Okay? Remember that earlier in this study, in, our, in the last couple of uh, chapters of this, we looked at the Apostle Paul's spirit-inspired description of love in 1 Corinthians 13. And that starts with these words, right? Love is patient. Love is kind. Yes. Patient and kind. They're hand in hand, like, yes. a, like a horse and carriage. The fruit of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Patience and kindness come out of love. That's right. That's right. Love for others. Mm -hmm. Now, we talked about that in the introduction to this, and we talked about this in the, in the, second, the first full chapter, which is about love, right? When you have love for others, patience and kindness, well, let me put it this way, love gives birth to patience, patience and kindness. And, kindness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and patience, coupled with kindness, and powered by love, can, I was going to say can lead to, will often lead to, Glorious interruptions. Mm. I like that phrase. Glorious interruptions. Glorious interruptions. So let's talk about kindness. Okay. Because they are, they, all of the, I said, you know, there's only one fruit. It's not, it's not the fruits of the Holy Spirit. It is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And I said it's like a diamond. It's, these are different facets of the same jewel. All right? So they're all interlocked, interwoven, but patience and kindness are truly part of one another, okay? Because you'll never be, if somebody, if you perceive that somebody is hindering your progress to get to do what you want to do, you're never going to be kind to them. That's true. I'm just thinking, what, when we get mad at somebody, what percentages, what percentage of the time is it because we're impatient? It has an effect on time what they're doing will cost us problems mm -hmm. that is you, you I never really thought how much it's of, of it that that time time is involved well right? praise mm -hmm. God we've accomplished something here in this <laughs> no but it's true because I don't think true. I don't think we often make that connection mm -hmm. that that's a, but you're exactly right and that's the point it's like when we become impatient with somebody we, we lose all kindness towards them because they're just a hindrance to us. We don't care about them. We only care about ourselves. So how do you get over that? With the love, right? Now, kindness, th this is a strange word, okay? I mean, look it up in the dictionary and you'll find it, it's poorly described in any dictionary I've looked at. And I've looked at a lot of dictionaries, mm -hmm. right? There's only one that matters. What's it in Greek? Aha! Mm -hmm. What's it in Greek? It is Christotes in Greek. Which is defined as? Well, it, it's not. It's kind of just, if you, if you look at a concordance, it's just basically going to say kindness or gentleness. Right. All right. Yeah. But how do you, I want to delve into the Spirit of God to find out what it really is all about. And to do that, I think you have to get back to the root of the English word. That kind of gives you a revelation, okay? okay. In, by, in, as I said, in the King James Version, by the way, this is translated, where we're, I'm talking to using the word kindness, the uh, King James translates the word as gentleness. But the King James also translates that same word uh, as kindness in many places in the New Testament, all right? Because they can't seem to make up their mind of which it, which it is. But... In one of the places that, it, that the King James translates that same Greek word as kindness, let me read you this, Ephesians 2. This is Ephesians 2, I'm going to read verses 4 to 7. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved, and has raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. Together with Christ. 
that verse kind of contains the key to the best approach to understand what the Lord's trying to what Lord is communicating through that word kindness. So if you go back to the to the actually it comes from the Norse. I mean it has roots in the Latin but it goes to the Norse. And kindness kind talks about when in Genesis God made animals and told them to bear after their own kind. Right? right. right? Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. The same kind. The same kind, but the root of the word kin. You understand the word right. kin? Yes, yeah. Okay, kind, kin, You're family. My kin. Family yes. <laughs> comes from the same place. Right. <laughs> so kindness comes. I mean, you want to know something? You, t you tend well. You should tend. I mean, we we tend to treat our family better than we treat outsiders. Yeah. And that, I mean, that would be normal human behavior. Well, no, you should no, treat, you them, treat better. them different. You, yeah. you, you treat do them. treat them different. Well, no, you, you should treat them better. I mean, it's a, because you have, a, you have a relationship with them you don't have with other people. Because they're your kin. It's blood. It's, you're yeah. my blood. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes we take advantage of them. Well, no, no, I, we no, no, but you're talking, you're talking about the people in the flesh, dealing fleshly okay. ways, all right? What I'm saying is that because we, we have a relationship you, you don't have a closer relationship than family. No. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's your kin. That's right. Kith and kin. Remember? I don't even know what kith means. I don't either. Okay. That's your homework? I, <laughs> I don't know okay. kith. But that's where the word... They're all asking, how do you spell yeah. that? <laughs> K-I-T-H, I know that. Um, but the, the kin, it's like your, your relatives, you have a relationship with them that makes your actions with them different. Okay? There's another... Phrase or a kindred heart. Well, it all comes from yes. It all come. It all has that same root. root. But all, that root is all based on relationship. Now that's why I said it was so important to understand here because it talks about we were we were quickened together with Christ. Yes. We've been raised up together with Christ. Okay. He is the firstborn among many brethren. That's what it says in Romans eight twenty nine. And if God is the Father, then we're all brothers. Yes. So right. we've got all kin. Yes. We right. have to be kind to each other. Yes. We don't have a choice. No, that's that's the way it's supposed to be. Exactly. Kindness comes from that relationship, or it's it's locked into and related to that to that relationship mm -hmm. with, with your brother, right? Christ is the firstborn of many brethren. We are his kin. Yes. We are the family of God. Do you remember that song we used to sing a lot? Old family. services with, with the family of God? So that's why it can also say in, in Ephesians, with good will render service as to the Lord and not to men. So if you do all things as unto the Lord, you're doing it like to your kin, to your brother. Yes. Okay? That's why, would you not be kind to Jesus? Absolutely. Yes. Kindness is treating everybody in every situation as if they were Jesus. Matthew 25. I'm going to read verses 37 to 40. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you. The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Be real. I mean, you know, if Jesus Christ himself were standing physically in front of you, you know, like the customer you're dealing with, the person that you're talking to, would you not be kind? Absolutely. Well, what in the world thinks you have makes you think that you have the right to treat that you have the right to treat me, or I have the right to treat Mark differently than I would treat Jesus Christ? If I do, then I'm being disobedient to the Word of God. And if I'm treating Mark as if I were treating Jesus Christ, I promise you, I'm going to be kind to Mark. Mm -hmm. And Mark going to be kind to me. Well, you see, you've got to think about that. <laughs> no, it's kind of hard. <laughs> And kind and kindness does not depend on what the other person is no, doing. No. Absolutely no. not. 
No. No. It'd be a lot easier if they were kind to you. Yes. <laughs> yes. But even yeah, that's what. Exactly. I would, uh, even if, you know. I, I'm going to take a little aside here. Okay. I want to get ahead of myself. I will tell you the absolute penultimate example of patience and kindness. You ever Can hear I guess? this? You're gonna. I guess you'll. I think you'll guess right. But go ahead. Jesus on the cross. That's that's it. Because, but it's, it's a passage to the cross. Because remember, that, that whole event is not just him being nailed to the cross. Yes, sir. It is the Passover. The it is a, from, from the Passover dinner mm -hmm. to the trial, to the crucifixion, to the burial, death and burial, to the resurrection. Mm -hmm. Right? You ever hear the song, He Could Have Called 10,000 Angels? Sure. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. You know that at any time, He could have put an end to it. He could have put an end to it. At any time. But he was willing to long suffer. He was willing to be patient. He was willing to wait for, there is an appointed time for every event. There was an appointed time for his vindication, the is resurrection. Painfully enduring? Yeah. Or something like yes. to that effect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. he, yes, he painfully endured. For the joy, it says, set that was before. set before him. I mean, all of these things, you'll, if you study the Word, you'll see all of these things are continually interlocked. Jesus was patient. He did not call 10,000 angels. He waited for God the Father's perfect time to redeem, to, re, to bring that redemption, visible redemption, by His resurrection. And, let me just say, and do you not think it was the, ep the epitome of the kindness of God when Jesus Christ hung on that cross, looked out on those who had just crucified him and said, Father, forgive them. Do you understand that when Jesus said that, he was not just looking at the people at his feet. He was looking across time and distance and looking at me when he said, Father, forgive him. Because had he not, I would have had no hope, nor would you. That's patience and kindness together. Why? Because it came from love. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. It was not the nails that... I've said this a thousand times. It was not the nails. I hear these debates. Were the nails in the wrists or the hands or the palms? It wasn't the nails that held Jesus Christ to that cross. It was love that held Jesus Christ to that cross. I was just thinking when you were saying how He, he was listening. That Jesus didn't do anything until, um, unless he heard the Father speak to him. That's what it says in John Throughout 12, that yes. whole time, I'm, I'm just thinking this now, the Father had been speaking to him. And he, that's what enabled him to continue to go on, because he couldn't do it on his own. So when, the Father was walking him through this whole horror, speaking to him, until the point in the cross when he cried out, why hast thou forsaken me? Because that, at that point, that point, God had to separate and not look at him. But up until that point, that was the Father encouraging him and, and pushing him on and calling yes. him. And I mean, that's amazing. It is amazing. It's, that's why they call it amazing grace. Yes. I want to tell you it's amazing. And that's why Jesus, I mean, it, the most amazing thing, I, the, the, probably the most amazing words, I mean, is Jesus saying, not my will, but thy will yes. be done to the yes. Father. He didn't, you think that in the natural he wanted to go to that cross? But he was willing to go. He even said, if there's any way I can get out of this, you know, yes. take it away. But at the end, at his death on the cross, it was one of the centurions that said, truly this is the Son of God. The evidence of a redeemed life. The evidence of God in us. I'm telling you, that will touch people around us when they see and I'm not depending on my ability to do this. I don't have to depend on my ability. All I have to do is surrender to God's ability within me. I have the power to do, to live a Christ-like life. If I were not, I would not be told by, by God to imitate Him. Ephesians 5.1, I would not have been told by Paul to imitate me as I imitate Christ. I have the ability to imitate Jesus Christ. Because it's not by power nor by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. It is the spirit of God within me that has the power to radiate this in, from my life. 
So when, when I have to, when I'm stuck someplace in traffic or I'm in, in, instead of cursing the guys that are sitting in front of me, I can bless the guys sitting in front of me. I can thank God he has, you know, that I can use that time, use that patience. Or when you get stuck in line at the bank or stuck in line at the grocery store, use that opportunity to be listening to God because he may have something for you to say to somebody else on that line or, or to the cashier. Or, or whoever. And if you don't think that's true, you haven't been paying attention. That's right. There's a purpose for everything. But you know why? Because the Word of God says that we, we have a ministry of reconciliation. I remember in, uh, I don't know if it was last week, uh, we were talking about peace and I, why is Jesus called the Prince of Peace? Mm. And I said, because he started, I mean, yes. thank God for the Prince of Peace because he brought peace between yes. me and God the Father. Right. He reconciled me to God the Father. Well, you know what? Now, that ministry has been passed along to us. We have a ministry of reconciliation. That's what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We are in the business of grace. Yes. I am saddened to have to say mm. that I've, I've done a lot of quote-unquote business with the church. You know, I, Alice and I have been in a ministry where we've been traveling the world for visiting churches of all denominations on five continents for almost 40 years. And I've had the occasion to have a lot of contact with a lot of churches, pastors. And I've had to say all too many times that for, for people who are in the business of gracious, for grace, a business of grace, they're not, they're not very gracious. Mm -hmm. Now, before I got saved, I was a consultant, a business consultant in New York City. And I've dealt with some executives from some, some of the largest corporations in the world. And, and by and large, I found them to be more gracious, oftentimes, than I find from a typical pastor. Mm -hmm. I don't get that. You see, we're in the business of grace. And if you're in the business of grace, you should be gracious. That's right. When you bring together that mixture of patience and kindness, that's when you begin to be gracious. You know, this may sound like a... a Alice tells me <laughs> that I'm going to be a grumpy old man. <laughs> Yes, there are some days. <laughs> no. how, how can a guy with a smile like this be a grumpy old man? <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> but I say it's because I remember the old days. Yeah. The way it used to I be. I remember the way it used to be. And I'm, you're becoming impatient. Well, no, it's not I'm becoming impatient. It's just I remember. I remember. That it was better. Well, no, no, I, I remember that when you were going into a, a store, for example, and somebody was in front of you, they wouldn't let the door slam in your face. Yeah. They'd hold the door for They'd you. They'd hold the door open until you got there and got through. That's be, was, just being there gracious. Was kindness. There was kindness. That's graciousness. Yeah. That's kindness. They were patiently waiting for you to get through the door. Yes. Yeah. And you know, you know what? I do that. I, I still, I'll do that. I mean, even if it means me standing there and waiting because somebody is 10 feet away or 15 feet away and I see them coming, I'll stand there and hold the door. And it, it seems to shock a lot of people yeah. that I would do that because it's just not their experience today. But I remember when it was. I remember when we lived in a kind of a, a gentler, more kind time. Yes. These are not kind oh, times. These are violent these, times. These are, and again, this is what Paul talked about in the perilous last days, that men become lovers of self. self. Um, Love will grow cold. I, I had a, a meeting. Alice and I met with a brother that we haven't seen in quite a number of years this past week. Uh, and he said to me that he, he remembers, always remembers the sermon that I preached because it affects him. And the sermon was about, uh, I, I know that the world is coming to an end because I get pickles on my hamburger. <laughs> yes. Remember that? I don't know if I remember the sermon, but yeah. I remember... Well, I used to talk about that a lot. As a matter of fact, I talked about that in the sermon. You know, I said I, I did these seminars, and that came out of a seminar I did in our, our ministry, the M.D. Solomon Institute. You would always order... Diet Coke without with ice, ice. Yeah. and the it. guys would be going, <laughs> yeah. what else do you want as they yeah. go get ice yeah. in the car? Same, same principle. Yeah. I'd go into a, a hamburger joint and ask for a hamburger and say, don't put, I don't want any pickles on it. And I'd get pickles on it. And I'd say, well, I know the world is coming to an end because i got pickles on my hamburger. 
Now, that's that's very sound theologically. And it, se and it seems very trite. It sounds trite, but it's very sound theologically. Yes, yeah. Okay? Because when men are lovers of self, the more you love yourself, the less you love others. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that means when you, when you love others less, you begin to care about them less. And when you care less about them, you become careless in your relationship with them. Mm -hmm. So when I say to somebody, please, I don't want any ice in my Diet Coke, or I don't want pickles on my hamburger, they're not paying any attention to me. No, they're, not listening. they're just in the habit of doing it their way, and they're not paying any attention to me. They're thinking about a date they got tonight, or are they going to get... They're thinking about themselves and something else. So they're caring less about me and caring more about themselves. And I, you know, that's... I, I'm not going to preach the sermon now, but that's what I say. I know that the world is coming to an end because I get pickles on my hamburger. Mm -hmm. It's carelessness. But carelessness is a lack of kindness. Right. It's a lack of kindness. They're not paying attention to me. They're not being kind. Because that's part of being kind. Is, is giving your attention to somebody else. It's being aware of what's going on around you. And that will make you gracious. Yes. And gracious means... Well, how, how often do you see a husband open the door of a car for his wife? I don't do it all the time. What's but if I'm on that side of the car, I'll do it. I mean, I, I try... And I, I, I wish to publicly repent for any lack of graciousness in my life. But that's the way we've been cultivated. We've been cultivated by this fast food theology that it's all about me and it's all about you do what I need right now and you do it as quick as you possibly can. It's not. It's not. Remember I talked about glorious interruptions. I mentioned that. Yes, right? yes you did. All right, so let me just repeat what I said a minute ago. Patience, when it's coupled with kindness and powered by love, will lead to glorious interruptions. It's all about love, right? Think about this verse. Jesus said, You shall love the Lord. He was an, a man came to him. What's the, said, what's the foremost command? And Jesus answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Okay? So the man that he's speaking this to then says to him, Okay, who's my neighbor? neighbor, neighbor. Now I'm going to read from Luke, Luke 10, right? But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, Who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers, and they stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And by chance a priest was going down on that road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. I want to get involved in this. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him, and when he saw him, felt compassion, and came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him. And whatever you, more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, The one who showed mercy towards him. And Jesus said to him, Go and do the same. Now, you want to know something? If he had been too impatient, it says he was on a journey. He had a destination. He had a place he was going. All right? He was going to Jericho. He could have looked and said, oh, I, you know, I don't have time for this. I don't have time for this nonsense. i got a place. But he didn't. You have a story. I was just oh, thinking I, the same thing. <laughs> where you were, you passed a person on the side of the road before cell phones. It was a little old lady. Oh, yeah, yeah, that one. And yeah. you that's were on a exactly, sales call. That's right. You were I'm on pointing. a sales call. And did you know the guy was a very precise and... Had oh, to be on I mean, time? I, yeah, what Mark's talking about is I was on my way. I was with somebody that worked for me, and I was on my way to a meeting with a Fortune 500 company, the vice president of a Fortune 500 company. And we kind of knew that if we stopped to help, there were two little old ladies, mm -hmm. that if we stopped to help them, we were not going to make our appointment. And it was a big, big deal. But we chose to 
go and do the same. So we stopped and we helped and we were these little old ladies and we wound up getting to our appointment about an hour late. Which meant there was no appointment. Which meant there would have been no this, appointment. This guy was a stickler for time. Well, this was well, back in the day in New York. Yeah, when you're dealing with a Fortune 500 yes. company, when you're dealing with an executive vice president of a Fortune 500, yeah. you don't you show up an hour late for an appointment. You don't have an appointment. You show up yeah. a minute but, late. Yeah, you don't have yeah, appointment. really, that's the way it was in yeah. New York. Absolutely. But we did what we knew God would want us to do. Uh, that does that take patience? It, it takes, yes, it takes, it takes control to say, I'm not going to zoom off because I need to be there. So we stopped. It took trust. It absolutely it, it, does. Well, it does. All of this comes out of trust. Mm -hmm. And it comes out of trust that in God's love. That he is okay? in charge. He is in charge. Okay? That he is in charge. So we stopped. We helped these ladies. Then we got back on the road. We got to our appointment an hour late. We went into the reception area in this beautiful big campus in the uh, suburbs of New York City. And the woman said, okay, I'll announce you to the president. We're, and the two of us are sitting there thinking, well, this is over and done. The man walked out, walked out of his office and into the reception area. And he came out just shaking his head and said, he said, I am so sorry. He said, I have never kept anybody waiting so long for them. <laughs> We were, we were doing God's business, God was and God care. was taking care of our business, <laughs> and he kept them occupied. And he said, sail, without even going no, to the it office. Was, no. it, it was just, it's the idea, but this is what said, happens when you trust said, that God is in control. And you do, this is what Jesus said, go do the same. Mm -hmm. This man's journey was interrupted. Yes. But it was, it was a, a glorious, glorious interruption. interruption. That's right. It was a glorious interruption. That Samaritan had the patience to interrupt his journey and the kindness to care for the unfortunate man, the victim. Your journey can never be interrupted by a stop for kindness because kindness has always been your spirit-led destination. You have a ministry of reconciliation. You have a ministry of bringing the grace of God, the presence of God into others' lives in every situation. That is your destination. The grocery store is not your destination. See, you know what that just made me think of is that people think that they have to, you know, they meet this person, they've got to immediately start preaching the gospel to them, getting these words into them, and it's the actions that is the gospel. Well, That's Jesus. It is the action, and it is bringing the presence of Christ Jesus into every place. We know a pastor that will present a decision and say, are, are, are you saved? And if you say no, then he'll say, why not? And I always like being around him rem to remind me that we should be doing that. Yes, but it's but not this, that, it's not, Yeah, that's what but I'm, I'm not saying that you don't do that. But I'm some, not saying yeah. that's not the only thing. Right. That's what people think. That's the only thing I have to do. I have to get this word at them. And then... There is a saying... Preach the gospel. Use words if you have to. But it's a matter of words and action. I haven't written. I've I've written some songs. I mean, I've written songs. You've never heard them. Long time ago. Long time. Because I would write them. I never. I'm not a songwriter. I used to be attached to my guitar. My guitar was attached to me. And I used to when I was praying. I would just often just be sitting there praying and strumming my guitar, and boom, there would be a song. You, know? you didn't write them. No, I mean, they, just, they would... God yeah. just told you a yeah. song through... Yeah, I mean, because I never sure. sat there and worked at a song. It was no. just all of a sudden it was there. Right. And I think the very first song I wrote was called Ambassadors of Peace. Yes, and the song was, We Are His Hands, and We Are His, his feet. feet. Bring, the Bring the good news to, to all, all that you meet. We are His hands. We are ambassadors for Christ. You know, sometimes people just need us to reach out and touch them. That was the next song. Let me touch Let you. Me touch you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because we bring that presence, that love of Jesus Christ, in the, and people need that love. People need that touch. They need Jesus Christ to come to me. All of you are weary, heavy laden. I'll give you rest. He said, "I came to set the captives free." This is the ministry of Jesus Christ. This glorious, wonderful ministry. It's not to bring rules and law. It was to bring love. And to reconcile us to God the Father when we accept that love. We have the power to bring that presence of Christ Jesus into people's lives. 
We have the power to bring them kindness that is the loving touch of Jesus into their lives. And sometimes we are just too darn impatient to stop and do it. Because we're on a journey. Whether it's in a grocery store or at work or on the bank online, I'm telling you, we need that patience, that long-suffering, that willingness to trust that God is in control. It's His time in our lives. You're living on borrowed time. Yes, we are. You are. Your time doesn't belong to you. Nothing belongs to you. It all belongs to the Lord. So when listen to the words, to the voice of God. Listen to the whisper of Jesus, as Arthur Bird says. If He tells you to go, go. If He tells you to stop, stop. Pray at the beginning of the day and say, Lord, give me the vision to see the opportunities that you put before me to be used by you to touch others with your kindness, with your love. It could change your life. And change the life of... Change the life of the person that he uses you to touch. And it'll change their life more. Well, hallelujah. Because at the end of the day, that's what it's all about, is having a changed life. And God's purpose in your life, God's purpose in my life, is not only that we are living that redeemed life today, but we are living it more today than we did yesterday, and we'll be living it more tomorrow than we are today. Because He has promised to bring us from glory to glory. He has promised to change us and conform us into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. That's reason for joy. Hallelujah. And you know, I was just thinking too, it's only by the kindness of God that we can repent of not That's what doing it says. kindness. That's what the Word says. So, hallelujah. Well, I, I think that's probably a good place to stop until we meet again next time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, if you're willing to patiently wait <laughs> until the next time, hallelujah. hallelujah. Father, we just thank you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you, Lord God, that you were patient with us. That when you looked down and saw us as such sinners, that you didn't just pew, smash us off the face of the earth, Lord God. But you were patient to wait for that appointed time when we turned to you and said, yes, Lord. And if somebody's listening to this now and they haven't said that, Father, I pray that your spirit would touch them now and they would turn to you. They would look up and say, yes, Lord, I want that love. I want your kindness to touch my life right now, right here. We just thank you for your work. In Jesus' name, Father, amen. Well, before we leave, I know that Alice wants to tell you once again. Jesus loves you. A lot. So God bless you. And until next time, may he use you for his glory. Show a little kindness. Show a little kindness.